that good? Works for me, man. No. All right, everybody. I'm sure all of you know who Iron Geek is. I've known him for many years now. He is fantastic. I've seen him speak at many events all over the country. And I love the shit. It's awesome. <laughs> Thank you very much for the introduction, Scott. Okay, I didn't originally know I was going to be speaking, and then I got a message from Robin going, So, what you talking about? I'm like, oh? And then I found out, oh, well, we'll see if we get someone else, and someone else dropped out, and I found out a couple days ago that I was speaking. So, this is the talk you all are giving, because this is what I suggested. Now, some of the slides, most of the slides have been reused from other talks I've given, and I'm essentially refocusing towards a particular purpose, and that particular purpose is how to cyberstalk potential employers. And we'll go into <laughs> why and where and why you want to do this kind of thing. First of all, a little bit about me. My name is Avery Crenshaw, I run iGeek.com. I have an interest in InfoSec education. I don't know everything, I'm just a geek with time in my hands. Uh, I may get something wrong if I do, let me know. I'm also the regular on the ISD podcast. I'm usually on Thursdays, but they podcast really six times a week. And I'm also one of the co-founders of DoobyCon. Yay! Yay! Yay, DoobyCon! And you only have one picture taken of <laughs> I do have others. I just don't know. I just don't think he has very good cyber stalking skills. That's the reason. Oh no. Okay, we'll leave that alone. Um, what stays at con? Well, have the conscious stay at con. All right. The why's of all this. First of all, you may want to find out more information that was on the job listing. I mean, sometimes they don't necessarily give everything you want to know. Like you know, the organizations in the general network layout. Uh, development environment, pay level. Sometimes these uh, job descriptions are written by people who have no idea what's going on as far as the actual technical requirements for a job. For instance, you know, the classic uh, 10 plus years of C sharp experience or something along those lines. Uh, I remember going to a job fair once and saying, I was looking for a job, this was back in the Nobel days, and I said, yeah, uh, I'm a C, oh, sorry, a Super Network Administrator, or as I said, S and E, and Super I Nobel. Uh, Engineer, and I think they thought it was some kind of nursing certification. Well, I'm having CNA at the time, I don't remember what I had. Anyway, regardless, it was a long time ago. Still look out there using Nobel, though. Alright, so, what's the info going to be about? We're going to break things down in various parts, but uh, most of the topics we're covering here are all have related names. Some people call it OSN, some call it scoping, threat printing, discovery, recon, or cyber stalking. Personally, I like the term cyber stalking. Now we're going to cover various subtopics of ways you can find information fairly passively on uh, companies. Uh, we're going to talk about email headers, a little bit about DNS, using Google's records and so forth to find information. Uh, finding out general information via the web using some uh, lovely Google hacking. A little bit about anti-social networks, as I like to call them. Some stuff on metadata, and a few other odds and ends. Uh, dropping docs. Hopefully I'm not going to drop docs on any companies as I... Uh, bring things up here, but uh, you never know, and if I do, I guess I'll have to cut those parts of the video out if it looks like I said anything that was um, too risque. Alright, first section we're going to talk about is email headers. Now, we have got a lot of information from email headers about the internal network, and uh, I had this job interview at um, a small college quite a few years back, and um, I basically took in the mail and sanitized it somewhat, what, and I'm going to show you some of the information we can pull from just looking at the mail headers. And generally, in like Gmail, it's like, oh, I think it's a one of the drop downs, show original. There's ways of showing this in uh, Outlook as well. And let me see if I can get this up on the web browser. Oh, boy, I haven't zoomed in. Here's two different emails that I would exchange while looking for a job at a certain place. And we find a little, a little bit about their internal IP structure of the network. We find out a little bit about what email systems they're using various uh, ISPs they may be using. <coughs> Chris, the real name of someone there. User agent. All this gives me a lot of information about what kind of technologies they're using at the company. Uh, much the same over here on email two. If I can get to scroll over. I can find out they're probably an exchange shop. A uh, little bit about whether or not they're natted. Like in one of the uh, one of these sets of headers, you basically find out that they're using non valuable IPs on their internal network. So that's extra information right there. So you can find a ton of information like that just from mail headers on people. So that's one example. Also, there's also things you can find out from uh, DNS. And uh, this next slide is probably going to be kind of um, remedial. 
for everybody in this room, but I'm going to cover it anyway. DNS is essentially the glue of the internet. I mean, you, most people aren't going to want to type in the IP addresses for every single thing they want to get to. So they have names associated with them. So you might map iNeed.com to that particular IP address. Well, there's also the information you can find out from this, and DNS holds more than just these mappings. You also have reverse DNS or pointer records you can look up to find out what the name is of an IP address. That might give you an idea of who owns it, as well as um, various other odds and ends you can pull out. And then there's also the registration information, so you can find out the information via who is. Uh, a few simple NS lookup commands for finding out the IP or finding out the host name. Uh, but what it really comes useful as far as DNS and finding out what a corporation has is doing zone transfers, uh, brute forcing the video of a dictionary, and in-map scans using uh, the list scan. Now, a zone transfer is essentially this. Zone transfers are set up so that DNS servers can exchange messages with each other or exchange entire lists of uh, host names and IP addresses. Now, unfortunately, some people have not secured this down properly, and you can basically dump all the names from their DNS servers. There's reasons why you might want to do this. For instance, um, I used a different technique to get this information, but I was interviewing at a company once, and uh, I decided to do a reverse DNS lookup on their entire IP range. Well, all of a sudden I see barracuda.nameofcompany.edu. And all of a sudden I'm going, oh, barracuda, what's this? Oh, it's a barracuda, I think it was a spam filter at the time. Uh, so I moved. Now that they have spam filter, if I saw something called Tux, I have the idea they're running Linux boxes. If I see something called Exchange 3, I can figure that they're running Exchange servers. It's all the information you can find out doing this. Now, this is just a simple uh, square, not exactly a screenshot, but a copy and paste of me doing a zone transfer using NS lookup. Um, you can also do it via dig. And if you were looking for a couple of domains to actually do a zone transfer on as a test, for the longest time, the only one I used was a ugent.be. I think that's like a German university. Uh, regardless, they would let you do a zone transfer. Most companies I personally encounter nowadays, and universities for that matter, don't let you do a zone transfer for good reason. But that one will. And uh, Digit Ninja, uh, you may, some of you may know him from Hack5. He's put up his own uh, domain uh, called Zone Transfer Me, just so you can you know play around with this technique and see how it's supposed to work. That way you can demo it without dropping some of the docs or having anybody complain about it, hopefully. Now, the techniques you can also use are like brute forcing. Now, this one's probably a little too noisy for what you actually want to do for a reconning a company you want to get hired by. But uh, you can use tools like Fierce. And what it'll do is, you know, let's say you have a certain um, domain name. It might try several common names like linux.imgeek.com, windows.imgeek.com, mailserver.imgeek.com, sql.imgeek.com, and tries to map out things that way. And you can feed it a dictionary of uh, words to try. What I really like using, though, is nmap and the list scan. So basically, you give an IP range and it gives you a reverse DNS lookup for each one of those IP addresses. And let me see if I can switch to that. And uh, I'm going to do an nmap scan. Is a uh, scan. So I'm not nearly as familiar with um, using Windows. I'm uh, sorry, I'm not really as familiar as using OS X. Okay, that's what it is. All right, let me go ahead and see if I can do a scan on that particular IP range. That's actually the IP range of the uh, hosting provider I have on geek.com through. But it still might give us some useful information. Probably not surprise you for that Barracuda, but... All right, we can find the names of some other machines and some other domains related to uh, DreamHost, who's my hosting provider. If I go through here a bit, you might find other stuff about the infrastructure. Let's see if we find anything interesting. If I saw something in here called uh, PIX, I might have an idea that's like a firewall of some kind. Uh, let's see. Or nudes. Or nudes? <laughs> you see nudes on there? Go check out that one. I'm not sure what law is. That might be one interesting to look at later on. Yeah, mess with lawyers. That's a good idea. Right. <laughs> <laughs> Let's see if we find anything interesting in this. Find a couple of name servers. I can probably probe those a little bit more just to find out what things are somebody on running. Network monitor. Now, if I go to that and I get a login prompt, I might be able to know what network monitoring software they use. Though I may want to do that over um, 
Oh, something else doesn't trace back to my home IP address. Uh, uh, if they had a better name for that, I might know what kind of mail system they're using. But you know, there's various information. This is the best example. There's various information you can pull out from just doing reverse DNS lookup on an entire IP range. And will be my slides. Give me my slides. All right, because of FUIS information, I think most of you all are familiar. Anybody here not familiar with FUIS? Okay, everybody knows what FUIS is. Good to hear. Uh, you can find out tons of information about by like, who is in an IP address or a uh, domain name and find out who owns it possibly, depending on how they have it registered. Some people register by proxy, so that information is hidden. Addresses where they're at, contacts of people there, so you can find out more information, so on and so forth. Also, the IP ranges, so you can do that trick I just showed you a minute ago. Billy! I wanted to see you. And you're not on at 11 this time, so. <laughs> right, for those who want to install who is, I think I was doing this demo in Backtrack one time, and the version of Backtrack I was using didn't have who is on it. <laughs> Go, guys, don't know. Uh, also, there's various uh, Windows tools for doing it as well, like NearSelf has some nice who is tools. And uh, pretty much any collection of network tools you can find for your phone will also have who is. Uh, a couple of online sites for doing this. I like RobTex pretty well, and ServiceNip has tons of functionality when it's up and running. Um, a few other things to do is trace route. Like, you want to find out what ISP this particular company you're going to be going to work for going through. Doing a quick trace route might very well give you an idea of who the ISP is, because there'll be one of the hops along the chain. <laughs> uh, just remember there's a difference between, try both the Unix variety and the Windows variety. Unix variety uses UDP for trace route, um, and uh, Windows uses ICMP by default. Uh, basically, the way, is anybody familiar how trace route works? Basically, you keep taking your time to live and, and uh, incrementing by one, and what you're doing is you're looking for that ICMP message that says, hey, uh, timeout exceeded, and whatever you get that from, that's one hop along the path. Well, what you do is you keep implementing that time to live, and you keep getting one step further along the path, hopefully, and I'm probably oversimplifying this somewhat, and you can correct me later. Hop after hop until eventually you hopefully have the entire path to whatever server that is. Along the way, you're collecting the names of those different hops along the way, so you might have an idea of ISPs, who these people appear with, and so forth. So would it be possible <coughs> to uh, actually make uh, your system impossible, uh, impossible to see on a trace route by having something that doesn't well, increase the time to live? Uh, then uh, you pretty much, let's not talk about breaking sometime later, I'll, I'll contemplate the ramifications of breaking various RFCs. But uh, <laughs> my, my guess is you could cause issues. Uh, I mean, I suppose you could say, well, first of all, I have what would be worried about from an ISP standpoint. And second of all, I mean, I, what, what are you trying to accomplish? So that nobody can see your machine. Well, I mean, generally, not going to see it. It's going to be in are you Are you running a, a router? You can just do it by dropping. Those trace route all the way up. Yeah. And if you actually do a trace route on a lot of systems nowadays, depending on what kind of trace route you do, which is why I said try both the uh, Unix and Windows variety, and the flags are doing it either way. Uh, some will block the certain types of ICMP messages that Windows sends for trace route, but not necessarily block the uh, UDP ones that Unix does. So, yeah, you can do that. I'm not sure if it's going to be that much benefit. Oh, another thing that's useful to do is um, set up web bugs. Now, because you can just sit there and uh, watch your logs or do something that you know stores your logs for a certain number of days, what I've done is certain web pages I keep and run. I put web bugs on so that I know whenever someone hits it, it tells me what IP address they came from, what the referring site was, and so forth. I put this on to a MySQL database, and then I put that database for the IP addresses of companies that I want to see if they're looking at my website. Now, I know there's been a lot of uh, noise about people at various companies doing research on social networks and so forth uh, about potential hires. Strange enough, I go out and check my site, and that's the conscientious enough to check it from home. They're not doing nearly as much looking into people as you would expect, at least not in my limited experience. But if people have had other experiences, I'd like to hear about it. But since you just have a little small image, and uh, whenever it's served up, it actually has some code in the back end to log that IP address, and uh, it's kind of useful to figure out what on your site someone's actually looking at. Like, I recently um, resigned from a position, and I was looking at my logs, and like, why is this person from HR looking at the INE.com website? Because generally, that makes me a little paranoid. 
Um, so, and now this one person I thought might be out to give me once. I remember there was a talk done a while back by, I think it was a, oh, Mudflap and a friend of his did it. It was on making an open source AK-47. And this one person who was trying to come after me for um, possibly being a threat or something, happened to have visited that particular site on my, on my, on Amgeek.com, and I'm going to go, oh crap. <laughs> so, you know, it can give you a heads up about that kind of crap coming down your pipe. <laughs> All right, finding general information about an organization via the web. All right, so you want to find out all sorts of details. There's so many good sites out there um, for collecting info. Of course, um, if you want to find out some general good sites for uh, cyber intelligence, check out the P-Test standard. They've got some guidelines on uh, doing research. If you want to check out old versions of uh, some of the sites, for instance, some people may also get... Uh, worried about giving too much information on the website and then take down information, you may better find old versions of it on archive.org, that's useful, using the Wayback Machine functionality. Looking at monster.com for jobs that you're not applying for can tell you a lot about what kind of technologies they are running at that particular company. Uh, Zoom Info can be a pretty good site for finding out information on uh, companies. Uh, Google Groups also, like, you want to find out, um, uh, let's see, if you want to find out about a particular company, you might be able to search by names associated with that company and find out that this particular person is asking questions about this particular type of Cisco router or this particular type of hard drive has failed on me. Does anybody know what problems it has? And you can find Scott answering that question for him and those kind of odds and ends. And there's a bunch of, uh, besides Google Groups, there's a bunch of different search engines that just specialize in forms. And this is a pretty good way to collect information, especially if you only know a few guys who may frequent or might go to that, uh, work with that company. You know the common handles, you might go search for them on these boards and find out more information. Or if you know the IP ranges, search for plus, a couple of tests of the IP ranges. Maybe someone's posted too much information when they're dumping out logs so people can actually help them out with their problems. And of course there's LinkedIn for finding people and uh, used that before. I've actually had issues where um, I had a job, I wasn't sure how much it paid, and so I was Googling around for uh, who might be on there, and the sites of the university site was a little old, so I found the person's name who I thought the job was, then I found out via LinkedIn that they just changed jobs, so that must be the job I'm applying for, so I was actually able to cyber the person from his name, find his personal website, find an email address, and ask him how much he was getting paid. <laughs> so, you know, with a few hops, it's uh, pretty workable. Uh, any social networks, of course, and like, uh, you can find a ton of information from people this way, and tons of people will friend others just for having a pretty face. Which is one of the reasons uh, I did a class a few, uh, about a year back on uh, cyber stalking. And actually, this is a much truncated version of uh, that talk. And I needed someone to cyber stalk in class, so I created a fake person, uh, Esther Pent. See if you can get the joke in that name. And a friend of mine let me uh, borrow her picture, and it's a lot easier to get friends when you look like that. Uh, drop docs a few places, and. Uh, just see how easy it would be to cyberstalk somebody by creating a fake identity. But always remember what you learned on 4chan and also from the Robin Sage incident. Rule 30. There are no girls on the internet. <laughs> Alright, cyberstalking sites. I've been trying to collect a good list of cyberstalking sites. Here's the distinct problem with that. Sites will be good for a while, then all of a sudden they'll start charging for everything or the quality will drop. Like it used to be rap leaf. Rap leaf used to be really, really cool, but then they pretty much gone all pay. Uh, but I try to keep a list of cyberstalking sites on my website in this great font, which does not show up at all in this lighting. If anybody needs my slides, uh, I can send them to you. Or if you go check out like the uh, four-hour version of this talk, I have it in there already. Uh, but a few of the useful ones here, Luna, PQ, check usernames. Oh, check usernames is really nice. Um, if you know you username for somebody on one site, you can figure out what other sites they're on by going to check username or knowem.com, typing a username like IronGeek, and it will show you the other sites where that is even registered or not registered. Where all the sites where that name is registered, that same person may be able to have an account there, so you can go poking around for more information. Uh, Yahoo Pipes is something similar you use for like, collecting information, and uh, crap, well, there's a lot of crappy ones out there nowadays. Uh, general, open book is kind of nifty if you want to search uh, for open Facebook uh, messages that people just post them to the wall and everybody can see. Uh, geolocation information. Uh, 
you can find out the location of a company, or someone that works at a company, you can use these, you can find out the username of someone at one of these companies, you can find out what places they frequent, maybe you can find out they go to a certain coffee shop and, you know, buy them a cappuccino and ask them for some information. And finding out their neighbors can be useful too. Oh, various tools for doing this, who's ever played with Maltigo? Uh, Maltigo is nifty. Uh, it takes a little work sometimes, but essentially what you can do is you can map out relationships and you'll have, uh, let's say you would drag a person object onto your Maltigo pane. You can then say, find everybody with this name, you might find a bunch of different, it has a bunch of different transforms, like it might go out and check, uh, what is going to give you an example? Let's say I drag imgeek.com's domain name into it. Well, right click, do some transforms, one of the transforms it might do is the Google's information, pull up Adrian Crenshaw. And Adrian Crenshaw might do a Google search, find other social profiles I have, and eventually you'll be building this cool web of interconnected nodes that shows you this information in a very, um, uh, well, I guess, object-oriented format might be the way to say it, yes. but it's definitely worth playing with. Uh, let's see. Let's see differences, I don't remember what that one was, it's been a while since I looked at that. All right, a little bit about Google hacking, I'm pretty sure this has been covered in a lot of the talks you've seen. But it's, it's useful for going over, um, just so you know how to use the right search parameters to drill down and get just the information you want. Uh, you can use this for all sorts of things, finding email addresses, uh, usernames at the site, uh, like possibly maybe doing a query for in URL, tilde, you know, on Unix systems, you might find a bunch of usernames that way. Uh, there's, there's tons of options you can use with this. Uh, I'll give you a few simple uh, Google operators. Site colon, like let's say you only want to search uh, a certain site, like uh, the company's website, like uh, papermail.edu. Site colon papermail.edu space, and let's say we only want to search for Excel documents. Right, search for uh, file type colon XLS or XLSX. That is the current one, correct? Yeah. And pull down all these things. And if you do it for university, I've seen people have social security numbers out there before. Um, but you can collect a ton of information this way. And if the page happens to be down, you can pull up the cache version of it sometimes using cache colon. You can search in title. Like if you want to find out, does this company have any open uh, HP Jet Direct printers? You might be able to do in URL and a common string you associate with that type of printer. I'll show you a link here in a bit that gives you a lot more information that you can look at. Um, <laughs> you can find ones that link to other places. Let's see, that's most operators I want to cover. The file type one, though, I really like useful because I can just search for. What? Oh, jeez, buddy. Sorry. Does <laughs> <laughs> Altigo also cover Foursquare? I honestly don't know. I'm sure that someone's written a transform. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I yet? A little bit, so. No one's written a transform yet for that? I haven't seen it. Okay. Uh, inverse search operators, that's for getting rid of stuff. Uh, let's say like I want to search for Adrian Crenshaw, but I want to leave out iGeek. I can use like I think it's a dash site or minus site colon iGeek.com space Adrian Crenshaw, and I'll get rid of some of the noise if I'm not interested in seeing the iGeek.com site. Synonyms for automated use of replacements like um, let's say let's try to think of a good one. Um, insect bug. Insect bug. Thank you. That'd be a good one. You automatically do put places. You can search for number ranges, and there's various queries out there you can find in Google hacking databases for finding credit card information this way. So I think Google's starting to restrict that down, but if you put in a pattern they think may be kind of malicious, they'll tell you, uh -uh, don't think so. Uh, wild cards for searching between quotes. Uh, certain stop words you can use. Let's see. Boolean operators saying this or this, but it doesn't necessarily have to be both. By default, Google works in kind of an and structure where it has to have all the words. You can also just use type symbol. Actually, Adrian, the uh, stop words don't work anymore. Don't they stop working? Because of Google Plus, they've overridden the plus operator. So you can't use it as a stop uh, word. Oh, okay. Uh, <laughs> nice. Well, thanks for letting me know now. I know. Uh, <laughs> Is there you a replacement stop character? Uh, I haven't played with it too much. I was just reading about it. But yeah, you can, you can no longer use it to basically say, yes, plus, here's my stop character. I'm surprised you haven't mentioned the girls around me. Yeah. Let's take it out. Yeah, you that. I didn't know about that. Yeah. It was publicly available data on Foursquare, and it basically was like a stalker's dream. 
The last stuff on, on these uh, slides, by the way, is going to be related to finding uh, stuff about employers. It was originally started as like a general cyber stalking uh, talk. But um, here's some useful uh, queries I like to do. Like, for instance, uh, NPH proxy is this common cool proxy that a lot of people use that they can put up on a website and proxy web traffic. Some people put it out there and not putting any kind of security on it where anyone can use it. So do a quick uh, Google search for NURL colon NPH dash proxy site colon edu, and it will turn a bunch of edu sites that happen to be running that particular for uh, proxy CGI. One reason this is useful is some places restrict who can access them to only edu sites. And I remember that someone contacted me because they uh, they could only reach other edu sites, but they wanted to reach iongeek.com. Well, using this, they could reach an edu site because they'd be using the proxy, but the proxy could then reach iongeek.com. So it's times like that when it's useful. Uh, in title, index of Etsy. This used to be good for finding people who had uh, file shares you could browse. Now mostly you'll find people spamming it because people used to go looking for this, uh, looking like this to uh, find kind of passwords and so forth. Now you'll find mostly a lot of honeypots. This is the last time I played with it. Uh, index of site IMD.com. This would be for finding the various directories that allow uh, directory listings. Uh, file type PPTX. That's for like finding PowerPoint slides on my particular website. A VNC desktop. That can be funny when people have open VNC sessions out there on the public internet. Uh, Adrian Crenshaw, I mentioned this before, minus site iongeek.com so it doesn't show anything from iongeek.com. Uh, oh, SNS file type uh, XLS or file type XLSX. That's that little O operator I mentioned before. That's one of the queries before I was used for finding social security numbers that someone just put out on their website. Um, Sometimes you can find uh, domain transfers of other people. That can be fun. That's where that dig comes in. In URL admin, you can find the admin consoles to a lot of types of hardware web, web interfaces by doing uh, in URL colon admin. Oh, I think this is for an access webcam. Uh, oh, LCD display dispatch. This particular search was used for um, finding certain jet direct boxes out there. So I give you an idea about the uh, kind of printers they use in this place at least. And also about the IP structure, because you can log into one, you can find out how to have things set up. And I don't know how, there seems to be a lot of printers that are found in the public internet. I'm surprised there's not more denial of services where someone logs into them and decides to be a wise ass and sets the IP address and the printer to be the same as the gateway. <laughs> That's an instant way to screw something up. I'm also surprised there's not more printer spam. You know, like, oh, I want to send a print job to every single printer. 9100, net cat out something to every 9100 port you find on a certain IP range. Perhaps that's coming out the printers. <laughs> well, that could be one thing, yes. Uh, let's see. Oh, searching for the IP range as well. This is a neat trick. This was not for useful for employers. I just thought it was a neat trick that I had to show. Uh, sometimes you'll find a picture on 4chan, and it will have a format like this. Well, that means they probably pulled it from Facebook. However, this particular number is associated with the Facebook ID. So if you did do a URL search for that number, you can find the Facebook profile it came from. So, you know, when someone's posting um, pictures on 4chan of, hey, check out this person I know. That's where you're finding them. All right, and a few examples for hacking people. In URL, Esther Penn, like I want to find all of Esther Penn's profiles. I might be able to use in URL Esther dot Pint. The Pint just basically acts as like a uh, space that keeps it all as one word. Um, and you can find some things, like I might find a LinkedIn profile or a Facebook profile. If I know one of the uh, handles, like Mr. <coughs> Leaf, I can use that as well. In URL, in title, uh, there's a ton of different options. In URL, user, in URL, IMGE, site minus IMGE, that's nowhere I've used for finding various sites at some frequency. So in this case, let's put this back to the original business uh, uh, related or the uh, getting hired someplace uh, related context. Let's say I want to get a job with Scott Moulton's company. I might look for Scott Moulton's profiles in various locations and find out more information about what he does, what interests him. In the past, I've noticed one job I interviewed for where I thought I was interviewing with and I found out they were a beer connoisseur and they grew their own homebrew. So that gives me a little bit of a conversation starter, as long as I don't, you know, come up from them in such a way that seems like I'm stalking them, <laughs> which I guess I am. Um, yeah, man. <laughs> as long as they don't know it. <laughs> oh, find out people's local ISSA associations or groups they're in. That can be useful. In your group, I'm finding uh, 
related groups that see similar things to LinkedIn as well. If you want a ton of different Google Docs or Google Database hacks, also Gifted and Google hacks, check out the ExploitDB list of Google Docs. And also, Hackers for Charity has, at one time, this out of date. They started updating this again? They're still out of date? Okay. To my knowledge, ExploitDB is still keeping their database ongoing. So you'll find tons of different ways for searching for different types of equipment out there, uh, printers, uh, different hacks for finding passwords, different hacks for finding insecure, vulnerable web apps, just tons and tons of information. A few general Google hacking tools for automating the hell out of this. MetaGoo feels pretty good. Uh, we'll talk about metadata here in a second, but what you can do is it for is like search search domains and suck down all like the, uh, let's say PDFs, uh, Word docs, Excel docs, and start extracting information out of them. Uh, Harvester is uh, also good for like collecting usenames because you'll find a bunch of email addresses. And from email addresses, you have a good idea of usenames. From the name, maybe you have a last name, maybe a bit of the first name, doing a little search in that area, you might figure out the person's full name. It gives you uh, an extra step in the process. Uh, let's see, online Google hacking tools. I haven't looked at Spiderfoot and Gulag in a while, so I can't say a whole lot about them. But there's all sorts of sites, tools that do automate this. Unfortunately, you start making queries too fast in certain types of queries, Google will start giving you that capture. So these may not work as well as they once did. Uh, GooScan is another one that's actually on the backtrack of uh, Live CD. Wigto has a bunch of stuff for uh, Google hacking and finding information. Let's see, site data file, MSN pawn. I'll uh, skip through all these. Oh, some of these uh, tools are using the old SOAP APIs from uh, Google. So you'll have to use um, as sort of like a in the middle proxy to make it function, as I understand it. But uh, I have details in there. Let's go. Let's go and start talking about metadata a little bit. Um, one of the tools I mentioned earlier was uh, MetaGoofield, because you can like, search a domain and start sucking down uh, documents from it. Well, one of the things we're looking for is metadata. Essentially, metadata is data about data. Uh, for instance, I'll uh, give you some examples here. The JPEGs, a lot of times, depending on what settings someone has on their camera, may put GPS information into the JPEG that you can pull out and find out where the person took that photograph. Or it might tell you what kind of phone they were using to do that. Uh, Word docs might have associations with what company it came from, or uh, various document formats actually store information about what printer it was printed to last. And from that, you can find out information about the network infrastructure also, because you can find out, oh, slash slash some print server name. Based on the name, I might have an idea of what's running on that print server, so on and so forth. Um, this is not really uh, very related to seeking employment. There's a few stories of metadata that I just love to bring up any time the subject comes around, so. Here's my favorite metadata stories. Who here has ever heard of Cat Schwartz? Uh, she was on Tech TV. Uh, what Cat Schwartz did was she took this sexy photo of what you see in the corner there, smoking, and uh, she posted up. Well, whatever software she used to crop it didn't modify the thumbnail EXIF data. So when you pull up the <laughs> thumbnail EXIF data, it comes a little lower. Uh, Dennis Rader, BTK killer, <coughs> he got caught. It used to be, uh, I think what he used to do was doing the whole classic uh, ransom note thing with, you know, uh, letters, maybe was, uh, but he eventually went to the modern age and he sent a word doc to the police. And this is after years and years and years of uh, not being caught. And inside the word doc, it had metadata listing the church he worked at. And then it also said, last edited by Dennis. Well, only so many Dennis's were working in that church and they caught him. And my lastly, my favorite story, and unfortunately this keeps getting moving where you can actually find more information about this, but uh, this guy, I think they're called Nephew Chan, posted on 4chan something about his aunt and having pictures of her getting out of the shower, and uh, he didn't want to post them, but other people said, post them or we're going to tell your aunt what a perv you are, because you have EXIF data in the JPEGs that tells us where your house is. Huh? I think you're talking about the same one about cabin crew. They got popped. Oh, cabin crew? I'm not. Yeah, there's there's actually a couple of guys from Anonymous. They actually they, they took a picture of a sign that they posted underneath one of their girlfriends. Oh yeah, I them. did see about that. And uh, the uh, FBI was actually able to trace the uh, the geolocation data back to Australia. So they set up for a few months, did a did a search, waited for like you know they they got as much information as they could. Then he started trailing it back. They arrested the guy, 
They arrested the girl, they arrested his friend. Then they did a forensic purpose match to make sure it's his girlfriend. <laughs> 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 They didn't arrest her. Oh, they did not? No, but she, uh, what I found interesting as well is that they matched her up. Uh, other pictures, and her head was never in the picture, so I don't know. Well, I mean, I imagine they found freckles or balls or something. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's another good uh, metadata example. But there's tons of different documents out there that have metadata in them. JPEGs, which I mentioned a whole lot, PDFs, docs, EXEs, even. If you want to find out, if you can find an EXE developed by some company, looking into its metadata it might tell you what the development environment's like. Uh, PNGs, uh, post Excels, there's too many to name. Uh, various tools out there for collecting metadata. Uh, Metagroup group feels cool, but also like FOCA. FOCA, you can type in domain names and just start sucking down these documents that have metadata in them, and it'll automatically start extracting things for you. Uh, so metadata, uh, FOCA is awesome for that. Metagroup is what I mentioned. Uh, EX, EXIF tool for pulling out EXIF. That's a hard imagine to say. EXIF information. Uh, the EXIF viewer plugin is something I use from time to time. Uh, also, Jeffrey's EXIF view is good. Uh, let's see. Oh, even more ones that. Oh, Creepy is kind of neat because it will go out there and uh, search locations in various. Uh, I think it's, it's Twitter and Foursquare right Twitter now. Twitter. Twitter and Flickr. Pull EXIF there out of Flickr and try to correlate and like, show you where someone's been so you can kind of track them out, which is nice and creepy. Uh, oh. Paul, at Paul.com, uh, Larry Pesci wrote an article on um, metadata a while back, which I think is worth checking out. So I just have a Google search for that because I don't know where the actual PDF is at this particular uh, point in time. All right, a few of the odds and ends. I already covered this one, the slide's sort of repeated. Um, but looking at header information, both email headers, uh, like I showed earlier, but also just telling the port 80. Or using, or using one of the many uh, Firefox plugins that lets you see headers. Usually, you're looking at and assuming they are pulling out the information. You'll find out what kind of web server they're running. Uh, let's see. Another thing you can look at is robots.txt to find out what places they don't want you to go looking at. By the way, uh, my robots.txt. You probably don't want to go look at it in my robots.txt. <laughs> but you know, sometimes people will put something in a robots.txt file. The way that it's supposed to work is search engines will look at the robots.txt file, and if it's listed there as disallow, they won't index it. However, certain the various types will go out to robots.txt files, look at it, and deliberately look at those particular sites. Nice. Like uh, someone went to mine, and they typed in, I don't know, it was private or secret, and said pound, so it wouldn't actually affect the URL really. Are you fucking retarded? <laughs> Who did they know what it was going to lead them to? <laughs> um, I'm malicious when it comes to robots.txt files. Oh, iEagle and Wiggle. This is a tool I wrote for, um, who's familiar with the Wiggle database? <laughs> yeah, this is, Wiggle is basically this uh, online database of people who go around war driving and they upload their points to Wiggle. So you have tons and tons of data going back more than 10 years, I think. Uh, and you'll go around the SID, the BSID, and so forth. The BSID is essentially the MAC address. Uh, by looking at this information, if you find a MAC address, you might even know what kind of apps that facility is using. And based on the location, you know what uh, they're calling their access points. All sorts of little bits of information like that, whether or not they're open. If they're open, well, hopefully they're using some kind of VPN to actually secure the traffic. Various odds and ends like that. Uh, the tool I wrote called iGiggle. Basically, um, you type in a zip code or a set of uh, geo coordinates, and it sucks down that part of the Wiggle database and turns into a KML file, which you can then open up in Google Earth, move around, and look at things. Uh, let's see, more information on this topic, and uh, I guess I'm running a little fast, but uh, I have a, like a, I don't know how long it is, four hour uh, class we did about a year ago on this uh, information, so I have that out there, if you want to check it out. I also have a ton of links on uh, sites you can use for doxing people, Got the information on them. Uh, the p-test standard is beginning to build up more and more information about that as well. And uh, the vulnerability assessment code UK also has a list of links that are pretty good. But I think I've replicated most of the ones from these two in mine. But then again, over the last several months, they may have added more. Uh, a few video talks, a few videos of talks you might want to check out. Uh, Kevin Johnson and Tom Essen did one on social zombies. It's worth checking out and you know finding out information from people. Uh, Sean Moyer and Nathan Hamill 
uh, did one called Satan's on my friends list, which I have to include just because of the name alone. They actually had an interesting thing where, you know, this debate, and they just wanted to put this idea in my head. There's a bit of a compromise between should I be on Facebook or this social network or not? Because if I'm on it, well, I might be revealing some information about myself, but if I'm not on it, then someone else can get on it and pretend to be me and friend people I know and find information on me. So it's kind of a catch-22 there to a degree. Uh, also, using social networks to profile, find your own victims by Dave Marcus. Uh, I had that up on Vimeo for a while. Vimeo took it down because it was against our terms of service for some reason. And they really wouldn't explain that out to me too well. But I put it back up since. And he goes into using various geolocation tools for um, cyberstalking people. All right. One last little thing. Just wanted to uh, mention DerbyCon's coming up on September 27th to the 30th. Did you have a question? Oh, you can do so. All right. Here's a collection of people from DerbyCon. Also, I want to pick various other conferences like Louis for Intersect, Sky.com, HackerCon, AutoZone, Freaknik, and Naticon. I go to all of those. And uh, finally, are there any questions? That was the drinking from the fire hose version of my uh, cyber talking tool. Cyber, uh, cyber talking tool. You think Shodan is helpful? I haven't really played around with Shodan as much. I mean, if you want to find out headers of uh, like who was running this particular variety of uh, Web server software, I imagine, but to YouTube, I haven't really used Shodan enough to be able to say. Have you ever used any of this at an interview? Yeah, I mean, I, I've done it to keep from interviewing. It freaks them out. A, a little bit. You know a lot about them. Uh, I also like, you know, looked around for like the mail server, the web mail server, and uh, find out that by default that they have email out there on a, or what is it, Outlook for the web, but they don't actually use SSL. And I bring this up to the person, and he has no idea what I'm talking about. Yeah. Virgil, who got sued for a talk he was going to give at Interzone 3. That never uh, happened. That was a myth. Researched all the... There's Billy shit. Billy was there and he didn't tell the story. Was, and, and looked up everybody that was at his deposition from the other company. <laughs> and freaked them out. <laughs> because, I mean, yeah. the talk is great, but the funny part is that you use any of the info during an interview. Yeah, you gotta be. Pretty funny to see the reaction. You gotta be careful so how you use the info. Uh, both sides. For instance, you might want doing the uh, reverse DNS scan and find out the, what they have no infrastructure. Then just boning up on that because you may ask questions about it. That's one thing. Saying you know, oh yeah, I hear you into beer. That's really great. Uh, what do you like to drink? Oh, what are you brewing now? That might be a little too much. Saying, oh yeah, your wife goes to Pilates class at this particular location. <laughs> That's way too far. <laughs> it's a chain shooting. Was that not It's great for social engineering. engineering. Yeah, part of her it can be great for social engineering, but depending on how good you are at being social. <laughs> Some people can say things and not be crazy, and other people. <laughs> like, I have this buddy, my buddy Rob, who can say things to women that would get me a restraining order, and I have no idea how he gets away with it. <laughs> I've heard say some of the most sexist things ever in front of a feminist, and she's like, "Oh, it's just Rob." I know. I, I, somehow he's got this like immunity, but I don't know. So it depends on how good you are at coming across that information. A lot of stuff I mentioned about collecting, I probably wouldn't directly expose that I know to the interviewer. It's funny how you're giving this talk about the time you got a new job. Yeah, that's true. <laughs> not that I did any of this to my um, current, uh, or my soon-to-be employer. No, not at all. I know who the soon-to-be Yeah, you do. Hey, it's only fair. They do it to us. Point taken. But see, that's the funny thing. I've mentioned using wet bugs before, and it's possible they're going home and checking me out and so forth, but I've applied to various places and then checked to see whether or not anybody from that particular uh, company's IP range checked out my website, and generally they haven't. Now, maybe they'll you know, be more surreptitious about it and checking it from home and so forth, but I would doubt the HR people would do things that way. They'll ask you for your Facebook password now. Yeah, yeah I've heard about a few companies that are doing that. Companies like E-Verify that will actually sell you their own website. So it's part of the background. Yeah, they're probably HR background, background check on me. That's why you don't see it from that company. I hope you've enjoyed the talk, and I know there's a few spots where I probably need to update it. But like I said, some, various of these tools and sites kind of stop working or go away. It's something that can be redone every couple of years with new information. But if anybody has any special techniques they'd like to share with me later on after the talk, I love this kind of uh, topic. So just give me a yell. Thank you very much for your time.